Hi, my name is Nicole Zellner and I'm a professor of physics at Albion College in Michigan. Today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some new views on the bombardment history in the Earth-Moon system and how those new views are affecting our interpretation for early life on Earth. I'll also talk a little bit about my own research related to the study of lunar impact glasses and what the ages of those impact glasses are telling us about this bombardment. So the first question we need to answer is why study the moon? As our closest neighbor in space, the moon is relatively undisturbed by geological processes aside from impacts. There's no water, no plate tectonics, and no atmosphere. So any evidence of impact over its 4.5 billion year history has been perfectly preserved in the lunar surface. These samples then are un undisturbed, and with these samples, we can apply radiometric dating techniques such as 4039 argon, rubidium strontium, uh, uranium lead, to determine when these impact samples were formed. Additionally, the craters can be counted using high-resolution orbital data, and in that way, we're able to get relative ages um, from superpositioning of craters and ejecta in order to figure out which craters are older and which craters are younger. Establishing the cratering rate on the moon is important because the lunar cratering rate essentially anchors the impact history for the entire inner solar system and even the outer solar system. So whatever we learn about the moon, we scale appropriately for size and, uh, size and gravity and apply that uh, impact flux to the other surfaces such as Mercury and the asteroids. So what we have here now is a graph that's going to show some different impact scenarios. On the y-axis, we have the relative impact or flux. And on the x-axis, we have time from the origin of our solar system to about 3.6 billion years ago. So as we understand solar system formation, there should be a lot of material falling in the inner solar system early on, but that material starts to decline in its intensity going forward. However, when the first lunar samples were age dated by the uranium lead dating technique, the investigators found uh, an abundance of samples with a uranium lead age of about 3.85 to 3.9 billion years they ago. They found a paucity of impacts before that time and a paucity of impacts after that time. This spike in impact right here is known as the cataclysm or the cata terminal cataclysm, and it's also known more colloquially now as the late heavy bombardment or the LHB. Not all investigators believed that this was cataclysm event actually occurred, but instead was the final sweep up of material from a series of early intense bombardments going back to about 4.5 billion years ago. New understanding of dynamical motions in our solar system, as well as younger ages being found in both lunar and terrestrial samples and older ages being found in the lunar samples, has now uh, resulted in a, in a fourth impact flux scenario known as the sawtooth. And here we see that the impact rate wasn't very intense, that it lasted for maybe 400 to 600 million years ago, and then slowly died off. So in the next couple of slides, I'll give you some evidence both for and against these various kinds of scenarios. Understanding this impact flux and really deciding which impact flux is valid is important because we start to see evidence for a cool early Earth in the form of terrestrial zircons around 4.3 billion years ago. There is evidence for water on Earth as well as continental masses at that time period. We start to see carbon isotopic evidence for life at around 3.8 billion years ago, and then we start to see the first fossils at around 3.5 billion years ago. So very, understanding this impact flux is important, right? Because it allows us to constrain some of the terrestrial geological and biological evidence that we see in this very early time period. There are various ways to interpret this impact flux, um, and a lot of it has to do with samples. So investigators are looking at crystalline melts in the Apollo samples that the astronauts returned to Earth between 1969 and 1972. We're looking at melt clasts in lunar meteorites as well. Uh, there are I believe about 130 lunar meteorites that have been found on Earth. 
We're looking at both terrestrial and lunar zircons um, for heating episodes that maybe occurred around this time period or could tell us when those heating um, episodes occurred. And then my specialty are the lunar impact glasses. So these are microscopic pieces of glass that form when an impactor collides with the lunar surface and melts that regolith into droplets of glass. And these droplets contain a memory of the chemistry from where they were formed, and they also contain uh, potassium, which decays into argon, so we can apply the 4039 argon technique to determine when they were formed. And then we can also look at orbital data um, and uh, count craters so that we can see the superpositioning of those craters on top of each other, and also looking at the ejecta blankets of some of the larger basins and craters to see how those blankets uh, can tell us relative ages, older or younger basins as well. So this next slide shows us a USGS image of the lunar near side and some of the ages that have been assigned to some of the largest basins on the near side of the moon. Again, these came from the uranium lead dating method from the Apollo samples at um, 11, 17, 15, and 16. Uh, we also have some um, uh, lunar breccias that were age dated with the argon 39, argon 40 technique. And these samples too uh, seem to point to some kind of cataclysmic event around 3.9 billion years ago. You can start to see that a lot of the ages of these largest basins are all somewhere around 3.9. I've also indicated what we think are the ages of some younger basins, Tycho and Copernicus, and also the oldest basin um, on the moon, uh, South Pole Aiken. This is the largest basin. It's about 2,000 kilometers across. We believe it to be much older than 3.9 billion years. There is other evidence that seems to support the idea of a cataclysm. Uh, for example, uh, Barb Cohen and her colleagues uh, looked at the lunar meteorites and looked at the melt clasts within those lunar meteorites and came up with a histogram of ages. So here we have number of impact events on the y-axis and age on the x-axis. And while they don't show a spike in, in impacts around 3.9, they also show no impacts older than 3.9. And so therefore, suggested in their paper that these ages from these 14 lunar meteorites support the lunar cataclysm. Uh, there have also been episodes of heating found in terrestrial zircons. This is the study by Trail et al. So what could account for this cataclysmic event? This uh, planetary migration was proposed. So in this model, known as the Nice model, uh, these investigators suppose that our giant gas giant planets didn't form where they currently exist. So here is their idea of the early configuration of the outer solar system, and you will see that the colored circles uh, indicate Jupiter, Saturn, Neptune, and Uranus. And then when Jupiter and Saturn reached their two to one resonance, they shook up the material in the Kuiper belt, and in that process, change the locations of Neptune and Uranus. So in the last slide here, we see uh, our solar system or the outer part of our solar system as we know it today, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune with the Kuiper belt uh, depleted. All of that material was, fell into the inner solar system around 3.9 billion years ago. So this is what was proposed as the cause of the cataclysmic event that we saw in lunar samples. But now we have very high resolution data from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. We have laser altimeter data and we also have camera data. We also have new interpretations of the old Apollo samples. We have more data to support our observations and we have improved analytical instruments. And so all of these uh, new ideas come into play when thinking about the lunar impact flux. In some really interesting investigations, uh, Grange et al. and her colleagues, uh, Lou, Merle et al., and Mercer et al., looked at the compositions of some of these samples that had ages of 3.9 billion years. So in the graph that's shown here, Marion and her colleagues looked at Apollo 14 samples, Apollo 15, 16, and 17 samples. And they found that all of these samples had roughly the same composition and the same age. And so they attribute then all of these samples actually coming from one event, Imbrium. So in the previous slide, 
Imbrium is this very large near side basin here, a uh, thousand kilometers in diameter. And they proposed then, um, in support of some early investigations, uh, for example, by uh, Larry Haskin, that Imbrium material contaminated the entire near side of the moon, including the collection areas of all of the at all of the Apollo landing sites. So what I've shown here now is um, the ages that we believe uh, can, we can assign to these large basins compared to the ages that I showed you before on that USGS slide. So on the before table, we can see again all of these ages clustering around 3.9, but in the today slide, we see that there's much wider variation in what we think are the ages, basically because we were attributing all of those um, imbrium samples to different impact basins when in fact they probably came from imbrium in itself. More recently, the gravitometry data from the GRAIL satellite has identified over three uh, multiple new basins with uh, diameters larger than 300 kilometers and has have also assigned new diameters to some of the basins we already knew about. So what this tells us is that the moon was actually getting hit with very large objects, uh, but the evidence of those impacts has eroded over time and is not visible in the uh, images we had prior. So all of these data then are, are pointing to um, having to recalibrate the crater size frequency distribution of some of the very oldest terrains on the lunar surface. And we also now have evidence for Archean impacts on Earth. So in particular, we're seeing um, impact spheral layers from very large impacts that are um, showing evidence of impacts on the Earth between 3.5 and 3.2 billion years ago, essentially creating a tail uh, from um, uh, ancient times to, to uh, more middle ages of the moon. So this late heavy bombardment lasted longer than we thought it did. And we're also, because our instruments are much more uh, sensitive, we're able to look at smaller samples or smaller clasts within the Apollo samples, and we're finding evidence for very large events older than 3.9 billion years ago. So all of this evidence together is pointing to impacts prior to 3.9 and impacts after 3.9, and that that narrow cataclysmic spike of only 100 million years or so in duration probably didn't happen. Here then is a histogram that shows the relative probability of a sample having a particular age. And on the x-axis, we have the history of the solar system from 4.5 billion years ago to the present. Uh, the colored lines represent uh, evidence of ages from lunar impact glasses, lunar uh, Apollo breccias, uh, lunar meteorites that have random uh, sources on the moon, and also the asteroidal meteorites. And see if these asteroidal meteorites give us an indication of the bombardment of the in in inner solar system and not just uh, isolated to the moon itself. So here we see that big spike in um, imbrium material or what we believe to be imbrium material. And so if we remove that bias, perhaps then all of these impact samples are showing something of a sawtooth uh, pattern to the impact flux. And then a relative quiet period here in the middle ages of the moon, uh, which is about the time that that great oxidation event on Earth appeared. Um, and also where we start to see whiffs of oxygen prior to the great oxidation event, and then random impacts that maybe aren't so severe or maybe well-preserved because they're younger uh, from about that GOE to the present time. Interesting things are happening on the Earth at this time, and I'm not gonna uh, tell you which of these data I believe. I will let the investigators who have specialties in these areas fight it out in the literature, but we are starting to see um, maybe evidence for life push back earlier and earlier in time. In particular, Elizabeth Bell and her colleagues at UCLA identified what they think is car uh, biogenic carbon in ancient terrestrial zircon, so perhaps supporting the idea for a biosphere as early as 4.1 billion years ago on the Earth. And then we also start to see fossil evidence for life pushing back the 
evidence for marine life to about 3.77 billion years ago and evidence for terrestrial life to 3.48 billion years ago. So all of this stuff is very recent and I think we still need to let it play out in the literature, but very interesting and intriguing when we think about the lunar impact flux and its um, application to the Earth's impact flux. So in summary then, um, in my opinion, based on multiple pieces of evidence, the impacts in the Earth-Moon system were not very frequent um, and perhaps were very prolonged. So supporting the idea of that sawtooth profile. There was probably no impact frustration. There was probably no impact sterilization. And the zircon, terrestrial zircon evidence is, is supporting the idea of a cool early Earth. We know that millions and millions of kilograms of biomolecules and, and those elements are being delivered to the Earth-Moon system. And so impacts are also um, providing the material required for an early Earth. So these impacts did affect life, but still it persisted. So with that, I will end my uh, talk. And I just have listed here um, some suggested readings. These are two literature journal articles here that might be of interest to you, um, as well as two popular articles um, with interviews from some of the investigators in the field, including myself. I also have um, an extensive list of references. I believe I've included most of them here uh, that you can um, reference. However, if there's something in my talk that is not referenced here uh, and you'd like to know more about it, please feel free to contact me. Thank you so much.